Isidore Kahani started his career as a textile designer in Zurich in the 1940s, and he worked with Gustav Zumsteg, whose company was called Abraham, and it was an haute couture silk textile manufacturer. But also, Gustav Zumsteg was a well-known, renowned art collector himself. His family started the restaurant Kronenhalle in Zurich, in the Bellevue, and today it's, it's a famous restaurant. It houses works of art by Chagall and Picasso and Matisse, and Kahani befriended Zumsteg and was inspired by his collecting and the very idea that one can own amazing works of art. Isidore Kahani moved to New York as part of the textile industry after World War II in the late 1940s and became part of the art world and had other friends in New York who were art collectors. And by 1958, he acquired his first work of African art. This was his first love, African art, and he had the opportunity to start collecting. He was actually inspired by modern art, which of course he had, uh, you know, having worked side by side with Zumsteg, he appreciated modern art, but as he was sort of a, a purist, and so he went straight to the source of inspiration for the modern artist, which was African art. These are the forms that inspired the artists of the early 20th century. In the 1960s, he chose to change his career path from a textile designer to, to become a dealer in Indian Southeast Asian art. And then he continued to collect the African art privately. It's interesting that the African art collection was then fixed by 1971. And in the early 1970s, the Kahanis moved to their home in the Ticino. And that's where the six masterpieces of African art have lived ever since. Isidore Kahani had an incredible eye, and he was collecting at a time where there were many African works of art potentially on the market. And instead, with incredible restraint, he really only selected the six objects that he felt were the best of type, the most magnificent examples that he could acquire. The six masterpieces of African art from Isidore Kahani's collection really demonstrate his not only his eye and his appreciation of the formal qualities and strength of the African art, but also as a great scholar and connoisseur, he understood their importance within the culture as well. The cornerstone of the collection is the Baga shoulder mask. It's by a Baga artist from the Republic of Guinea. It's carved from a single piece of wood, and among the Baga people, it's highly symbolic. It represents sort of a supernatural woman who's the idea of the ideal. And so it's somebody obviously with great skill and who's well respected in the community who has the privilege to, to wear the baga, which the indigenous name is, is Nimba or Nimba mask. But when it was first seen by Europeans, it was something that was sort of a revelation, really astonishing to them. And it inspired artists like Picasso and Giacometti. In his sketchbook has drawings of the baga shoulder mask. So it's highly iconic work of art. The artist in particular showed this amazing sense of balance and there's the repetition of the crescent forms, which I mean, you can imagine that the crescent is a lunar symbol, a universal symbol for women and female power. And she represents a woman who is at the zenith of her power, fertile, intelligent, pure of heart, and so when she appears, it's a representation of, of new beginnings. Not every nimba is as, as balanced in, in terms of the overall form. It's really the sense of balance, the treatment of the, of the mask. The amazing patina, it has a highly developed surface which indicates extensive use within the culture. This type of sculpture influenced Picasso quite directly, we know. He saw uh, an example at the Trocadero as early as 1907, and by the late 1920s, he actually owned a, a similar headdress, and it inspired his sculptures that were of Marie Therese Walter, which, who was his, his mistress at that time. The, so the, the symbolism wasn't lost on him in terms of this being an important symbol of fecundity and female power. The Fang figure is also an iconic form of African art. It was one of the first works of art that really became part of the lexicon of African art as art as opposed to sort of ethnography or anthropology. And this language for talking about African art was established in the early 20th century by the great modern art dealer Paul Guillaume, and who saw Fang works of art as the pinnacle of 
African works of art, the, the beautiful form, the comportment of the sculptures. So he really set forth the language. And, and so still today, we look at Fang works of art as, as really an amazing archetype or icon. And this example in particular, the Kahani Fang figure, is perfection. I mean, it's this symphony of repeating forms. Just formally, it's, it's exquisite. And also it has this amazing patina, which is uh, palm wine oil patina. So that was anointed over years and years. And so still today, it seeps the oil, it's almost as if it's living. The Kahane Ballet Mask is something that's actually a revelation. It's called a moon mask, which you can see from the beautiful form, and it has this beautiful jewel-like quality. And we know of four other moon masks, but none have the metal covering, which we see in the Kahane example. So this is unique as far as we know. But in addition, it's just the treatment of the form, the purity of the lines, is something that's quite exceptional and exceedingly rare. It's just a jewel. I mean, it's sort of otherworldly in a way. And this is also a form that's quite iconic. It's a kota, reliquary figure, and it's a rare style. It's specifically among the kota people of Gabon. It's uh, the Obamba group. And what's interesting too is the beautiful scale and these the sort of finials that are at the top of the figure. It makes it a rare composition. And it's created with very fine strips of metal, of uh, brass and copper uh, alternating to create sort of a, a very subtle vibrancy to the, to the surface. It's almost like finely tailored clothing, the way every each piece is very mannered and laid out. And the eyes are so striking too, this sort of lenticular shape of the eyes. It's, it's very captivating. Isidore Kahani was extremely private, and only a few close friends really knew about his personal passion and about his collection of African art. So it's, it's a revelation to the market. No one knew that it's a treasure trove. No one knew that the pieces existed and that these, these six works have been living quietly in, in Switzerland over the last 35 years. Isidore Kahani was an incredible connoisseur. It was not just an intellectual, but a visceral connection with each work of art that, that passed through his hands.